Of course, there's a distinction between Islam as a belief versus Islamism, which is a far-right political movement. I think uh, some of the ISOC members will know uh, what I mean by Islamism as yeah, a far-right political you movement. The whole ISOC but Islam for the isn't, unfortunately, the in the whole people have, All right, well, people you can have a right to religion. Unfortunately, Islamists will hack beloved Bangladeshi bloggers to death in Bangladesh, whilst pe placing Bangladeshi bloggers who are based in the UK on an international death list. And of course, lovely British jihadis. Can we, questions at yeah, the end, lovely please. British jihadis. Is it really funny that people get hacked to death? It's really funny, but yeah, it is. I, I know. I know it's funny for you. Um, I've also been accused of practicing tapia by far-right groups like. He just told you to shut. And who have the other to stand there? Don't tell me to sit down. Don't tell me to sit down. Who are you to tell me to sit down? This person is telling us to shut the up. He's telling us to shut the up. Did anyone hear that? Well, I'll explore it by your point. You can. Yeah, it's okay. Bye bye. This still frame was featured on a PowerPoint presentation given by Miriam Namazi, a British-Iranian secular and human rights activist, and on the 20th of April 2021 it was published by TEDx Talks. Well, I say that they published her presentation, but more accurately they published merely her talk. You see, they removed all of her slides, and in doing so not only stripped her message of context, but worse, undermined her cause entirely. Further still, they issued a prominent disclaimer, warning that some viewers may find elements of this talk to be distressing or objectionable, all whilst emphasising that the content of any talk does not necessarily represent the views of the TEDx organisers. Now let me make this clear from the outset. What follows is a criticism of TEDx, but the criticism goes beyond them. TEDx is just a mere cog in a machine, a fragment of a structure that for far too long has upheld an Islamic de facto blasphemy law, at the expense of one of the most marginalised communities on the planet, ex-Muslims. I'll expand upon this later, but first, let's have a talk about TEDx Talks. Now today, you're part of a truly remarkable global phenomenon. Around the world, thousands of people have been gathering in meetings to experience the power of ideas. According to TED's website, TEDx is a program created to bring the spirit of TED to local communities around the globe. Each event is organised independently under a free licence, which in exchange insists that all talks abide by a set of guidelines. It is, no doubt, a brilliant initiative that's enabled some truly incredible content but it's not without its problems, with one being selective enforcement. And this brings us back to Namazi. Why did TEDx 1 issue a disclaimer on her talk, and 2 remove all of her slides? Let's start with the former. The first sentence off, some viewers may find elements of this talk to be distressing or objectionable, is a textbook trigger warning. And so you might be expecting, as I did, for such a disclaimer to be on all controversial TEDx talks. But no, this isn't the case. In fact, as of this time, I genuinely can't find a single other instance in which TEDx has issued an equivalent statement, despite the fact that some talks are most certainly objectionable to use their language. Consider, for instance, Blair Romani's talk, titled Queer and Muslim, Nothing to Reconcile. In addition to being a Muslim woman, I am a black queer person. And... A mere glance at the comments reveals that an overwhelming majority of Muslims found the content distressing, which of course isn't surprising given the abhorrently poor acceptance rate of the LGBTQ community within Muslim-majority countries. For reminders, here's a world map depicting Muslim population, and here's a world map depicting countries with laws against LGBTQ expression. To date, Amani's talk is among the worst ever received, and yet TEDx didn't, and has never, felt the need to issue a disclaimer. The same is true of Abia Bakai's talk, in which she claims that Islam is a feminist religion. If someone were to come to me and tell me, oh, so are you a feminist? I'd probably just be like, no, I'm just a Muslim because I don't need to be a feminist. Well over half the audience found her talk distressing, but once again, no disclaimer in sight. And to give just one more example, let's take a gander at Jung A. Jahangir's talk. Islam not only affirms the legitimate human need for intimacy, affection and companionship, but goes ahead to offer a legal contract 
for the sexual expression of LGBTQ Muslims. I have to say, and to my surprise, that his talk went down a treat, being one of the highest rated TEDx talks of all time. Oh wait, no it didn't. It went down like a sack of objectionable potatoes. Alright, so what's my point? Well, simply stated, if TEDx's aim is to warn people that they might find a given talk distressing and objectionable, then they are not even close to being consistent. Moving on, let's now consider why all of Namazi's slides were removed. As you might be aware, every TEDx talk has within the title the location of where it was filmed. Given this, should a talk have technical problems, such as all of the slides missing, one can easily check to see if the issue is exhibited by other talks from the same event. For instance, Alia Salim's talk, which likewise to Namazi's is from the perspective of someone who's left Islam, unfortunately has extremely poor audio quality. Hi. So when I was first having the invitation But since the title includes the location of where it was filmed, it's easy to check if other talks from the same day have poor audio. And they do. So, fair enough. But Namazi's doesn't have the location in the title. Again, this is completely out of character for TEDx. Because of this, I presume that the organisers must have personally requested for the location to be omitted. But the fact that they, Warwick, feature Namazi on their website contradicts this, and thus suggests that the decision was made independently by TEDx headquarters. Anyhow, to get to the point, the other Warwick talks from the same day have maintained their slides, and so surely Namazi's slides must have been seriously objectionable, right? Well, let's take a look. The first slide consists of just the title of the talk. The second contains a still frame of someone attempting to suppress Namazi's message. The third is of The Guardian supporting Warwick University's banning of Namazi. The fourth is the Iranian regime calling Namazi a harlot and immoral. And, well, while we could do this for all of the slides, I think it's already quite clear that TEDx didn't have anywhere near sufficient justification to remove all of them. Now, if we want to be charitable, and we should, it could be argued that, perhaps, some of Namazi's slides justified a level of alteration, such as her nude photos. But then again, if other TEDx talks display nudity, and they do, why can't Namazi's? What's with the double standard? What's with the selective enforcement? Why allow Jade Bill to bravely challenge orthodoxy with nude slides, but entirely omit Namazi's? I mean, one of Namazi's slides reads, My body is not obscene. Veiling it is. Well, TEDx evidently disagrees, don't they? Seeing no rhyme or reason, I personally asked Namazi whether TEDx informed her of which guidelines she violated, and she's given me permission to reveal that they said that her talk constituted political speech, which is a violation of their second guideline. It reads, Politics, social issues, and policies are key parts of the global conversation. However, TEDx stages are not the place for partisan politics, nor extremist or inflammatory positions. Right, so when Amani directly confronts the social issue of LGBTQ rejection, TEDx quietly shelves their policy of not talking about social issues. But when Namazi references how she in the past has confronted the social issue of forcing a veil on half the human race, TEDx dusts off their policy and strictly enforces it. Likewise, when Bakai claims that Islam is a feminist religion, TEDx forgets that they have a policy against partisan politics and inflammatory positions. But when Namazi suggests that Islam is in opposition to feminism, TEDx insists on veiling her in their policies. Absent adequate justification, the only reasonable conclusion here is that we're witnessing an instance of the Islamic de facto blasphemy law, being enshrined in typical fashion through selective enforcement. Namazi, for one, is happy to call a spade a spade. It's a question of saying, look, we're, we're, we're free thinkers. Uh, we want to criticize the Islamic right, like the Christian right. Uh, we want to uh, be able to criticize Islam as a ridiculous idea, as all religions are. Uh, but that's not the same as attacking Muslims. That's not the same as attacking people. And I think it, you know, it's something that's conflated as a way, really, of silencing criticism. I mean, that's what's happened. And the Islamic movement is doing that, you know, trying to silence criticism. It's a way of imposing blasphemy laws here in Europe where blasphemy laws don't exist. So in Iran, nobody will accuse you of Islamophobia or bigotry against Muslims. They'll call you an apostate, a blasphemer, and you go to prison and you get the death penalty for it. Here, they use terms like Islamophobia, 
um, as, as, and, and bigotry and racism as a way of imposing those laws, uh, you know, de facto rather than in the law. The prior clip was filmed long before Namazi gave her TED talk, but her words express precisely the mechanism by which they censored her. Now, I hope she doesn't mind my blasphemy here, but she's not a prophet. That is, this isn't a prophecy coming true. Rather, she's been on this rodeo before, since this issue is not, as I said at the beginning, specific to TEDx. They are but one brick in the wall upholding the Islamic de facto blasphemy law. Another, for instance, is YouTube, which, again, is an incredible initiative that I owe my livelihood to. However, I didn't even attempt to monetize this video, since I didn't want to run the risk of degrading my standing with the hand that feeds me. But I can tell you one thing for sure. If I was grilling TEDx in reference to Christianity, rather than Islam, I'd have monetized without worry. Hence, the system disincentivizes people like me from criticizing Islam. And again, this isn't YouTube's fault. It's not up to them what content advertisers are comfortable having their products and services displayed upon. The problem, the wall, is the zeitgeist. It's us. Until we consistently endorse secularism, the Islamic de facto blasphemy law will remain, and ex-Muslims will continue to suffer systemic oppression. The last thing I'd like to say on this matter is that I strongly suspect that the vast majority of organisations that uphold the Islamic de facto blasphemy law have the best of intentions, that they genuinely care about the feelings and sensitivities of Muslims worldwide. But when, for instance, TEDx so overtly censors and undermines the experience and perspectives of people like Namazi, they not only do her a grave disservice, but ex-Muslims as a whole a disservice. They obliquely validate the narrative spun by Muslim fundamentalists, the narrative that depicts apostates not as people struggling for basic human rights, but rather as indecent, cantankerous radicals that are hell-bent on insulting others as to quench their narcissistic thirst. Further still, and on the other hand, they embolden the erroneous notion that the average Muslim can't handle a little bit of criticism, a joke or a cartoon, and thus they fuel the flames of the bigotry of low expectation. Ex-Muslims are among the bravest people alive, and they not only deserve our love, respect and support, but in many cases, they damn well need it. Let us not forget that as of this moment, at least 10 countries demand the death penalty for apostasy, and that just over a quarter of the world's countries and territories enforce anti-blasphemy laws. The very least we can do is open our arms, hear their voices, and respect their courage. Namazi's TEDx talk currently doesn't have many views, which, let's face it, isn't surprising considering its gutted state, but nevertheless, I highly recommend checking it out. And on that note, and as always, thank you kindly for the view, and an extra special thank you to my wonderful patrons and those of you who have supported the channel via other means. I sincerely appreciate it.